I said yesterday that I was a little uncomfortable with uh, this man looking over my so uh, shoulder, and the Du Bois Institute promised that they would replace this <laughs> with a, a portrait of W.B. Du Bois. <laughs> but T.R. is still here, and I'm still hopeful that by tomorrow, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, you know, just a word about Nathan Huggins. I knew him. Um, he was. He lived and taught and uh, worked on the West Coast uh, when I was at UCLA and um, latter stages of his life he was writing a biography of Ralph Bunch um, who was the first African American to get a PhD in political science at Harvard University um, and was valedictorian of his class at UCLA and uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1952 for mediating the first Arab-Israeli war. Nathan was a terrific uh, person, and we would sit at the faculty club and have lunch, and uh, I was always eager to hear about the progress of the Bunch biography, and fortunately, he didn't have a chance to finish before he died, uh, but he was a first-class historian and a first-class person, so it was a special honor to be asked to give the Nathan Huggins lectures. <coughs> White historians have taken, taken it for granted for a very long time that slavery could not have been abolished during the revolutionary era. During our bicentennial of the revolution in 1976, it was commonplace to commend the founding fathers for not attempting to abolish slavery, a step regarded as hopelessly idealistic, if not fanatical, and the word fanatical was often used in discussions of this. Why fanatical? Partly, it is argued, because white men were only gradually coming to see that slavery was a peculiarly degrading and uniquely brutalizing institution, to quote uh, one historian. Research in recent years about the roots and the extensiveness of abolitionist thought, led by David B. Davis, your Nathan Huggins lecture three years ago, has demolished this notion that it was beyond the cognitive reach of the revolutionary generation to imagine that slavery could be abolished. We now understand that abolitionist sentiment was widespread, though of course unevenly, through the nation. But the main reason for calling anti-slavery efforts fanatical is the argument that any attempt to abolish slavery would have shattered the newly formed Union of States. The intransigent intransigence of Georgia and South Carolina, it's argued, would have guaranteed that. In such a situation, idealism had to be tempered with pragmatism, and pragmatism trumped idealism in any showdown. Thus, even if anti-slavery had emerged as a key element of revolutionary, of revolutionary thought, a campaign on its behalf, the argument goes, could not surmount the threat of disunion. The argument that slavery could not have been abolished, it seems to me, reeks of the dangerous, indeed odious, concept of historical inevitability. Almost always in historical writing, a concept put forward by those whose mistakes are excused and virtually never by those victimized by mistakes. The idea of historical inevitability that is, that things could not have turned out differently, is a winner's argument. It's as old as the tales told by ancient conquerors. Philosopher Isaiah Berlin put it this way, those who invoke the idea of historical inevitability argue that the behavior of men, I'm using his words, the behavior of men is made what it is by factors largely beyond the control of individuals. Our sense of guilt and of sin, our pangs of remorse and self-recrimination are automatically dissolved. The tension, the fear of failure and frustration disappear as we become aware of the elements of a larger organic whole of which we are variously described as limbs or elements. Viewed in this new light, our historical actions turn out to be no longer wicked but right and good because necessitated, end of quote. 
it's time to reconsider this entire matter. Let's begin with a brief review of five interlocking factors in the 1780s and early 90s that made this, in my view, an opportune time for abolishing slavery. First, it was the era when the sentiment for ridding American society of a blood-drenched labor system widely agreed to be an insult to the entire thrust of the revolution's sponsorship of universal rights was at its peak. Beginning with Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Massachusetts, northern state legislatures and Supreme Courts were abolishing slavery, gradually to be sure, but with moral certitude. As for Maryland and Virginia, the region with the greatest number of slaves, Jefferson believed in his words, from the mouth to the head of the Chesapeake, the bulk of the people will approve of extirp extirpating slavery in theory. And the notion will find a respectable minority ready to adopt it in practice, a minority which for weight and worth of character preponderates against the great number who have not the courage to divest their families of a property which, however, keeps their consciences unquiet, unquote. North Carolina, farther south, in 1790, insisted that slavery be banned from the Western lands it was ceding to the national government. North and South, religious leaders led by the fast-growing Baptists and Methodists were speaking about the necessity of cleansing the nation of a national sin. A recent book on pro-slavery, on the thought of pro-slavery uh, writers, finds that from 1775 to the early 19th century, almost no Southern leader defended slavery. Second, this was the moment when the most resistant part of the new nation, the Lower South, Georgia and South Carolina, was most precariously situated and ill-prepared to break away from the rest of the nation, a topic I'll pursue in a moment. Third, it was a period when the system of thought called cultural environmentalism was in full sway. Cultural environmentalism held that Africans were by no means inferior through biological uh, conditions, biological inferiority, something caused by nature, but by a lack of nurture, a systematic denial of uplifting education or opportunities to improve themselves, accompanied by brutal treatment that extinguished sparks of genius. No inborn disability, argued the environmentalists, stood in the way of emancipation which would allow the flowering of black talent. Fourth, it was a time when the opening of the Trans-Appalachian West, after England surrendered its claims to this vast territory at the end of the war, provided the wherewithal for a compensated emancipation. It would have been expensive, yes, to emancipate the slaves after compensating their owners. But as early as 1775, a Kentucky clergyman showed in great detail that, that this state could use its western lands to indemnify its slave owners at a relatively modest cost. Of course, there were many more slaves in the South, but even if no southern state would devote its own resources to effect a compensated emancipation, there were still these huge western lands ceded by the states to the federal government. They promised what our leading historian on western lands tells us was a virtually inexhaustible revenue to promote the common interests of all the states and strengthen the national government. With independence assured in 1783, many political leaders, including Jefferson, promoted the use of the western lands to underwrite the creation of what in Jefferson's phrase was called the, an, an empire of liberty. If the land had been sold at $2 an acre, the proceeds could have purchased the freedom of every adult slave in the country, ensuring a true empire of liberty rather than an empire of slavery. And lastly, the outbreak of black rebellion in what is today's Haiti in 1791 and the thunderclap decision of the French Revolutionary government in February 1794 to emancipate half a million French slaves, 
along with the almost simultaneous passage of a bill in England's House of Commons to abolish the English slave trade led to a crescendo of anti-slavery radicalism by the mid-1790s. As Washington started his second term as president, the belief spread that the entire Western world was poised to reverse the sordid three-century descent into European-sponsored African slavery. In the view of many, the times seem now at hand. Let me turn now to the argument central to the defense of the revolutionary generation's inability or unwillingness to abolish slavery, that the nation's frailty, the, fr the fear of splitting up at the beginning would not permit such a fundamental change. No one doubts that the Confederation of 13 American states was imperfectly fit knit together. Indeed, for this reason, the Americans barely won the War of Independence, only as it happened with massive French and Dutch aid. But how could the Union of States be strengthened? Pondering the tenuousness of the post-revolutionary Confederation of States, historians have seldom considered that a national plan for abolishing slavery might have been an integrative rather than a divisive mechanism. Is it really a counterfactual flight of fantasy that ending slavery might have helped create a genuinely national society out of semi-separate, fractious regions? Is it not possible that this could have bolstered union by eliminating a rankling sore in the body politic and, complete, and completing a reform without which post-war American society could never be ideologically true to itself? And is it not true that any society where its people's behavior aligns with their principles is stronger than one in which practice and principle are at odds. Many at the time were full of foreboding that the new nation could not survive an abandonment of principles widely subscribed to during its blood-filled birth. It is likely that a national referendum would have supported the proposition of Maryland's Luther Martin in 1788 that, in his words, slavery is inconsistent with the genius of republicanism and has a tendency to destroy those principles on which it is supported as it lessens the sense of equal rights of mankind and habituates us to tyranny and oppression, unquote. He directed those remarks which pinpointed slavery as a main contributor to political fragility amidst heated debates in Maryland over ratifying the Constitution. It ought to be considered, he said, that national crimes can only be and frequently are punished in this world by national punishments, unquote. He withdrew from the Constitutional Convention and refused to sign the document because he regarded the three-fifths compromise and the protection of the slave trade as in his words, a solemn mockery of an insult to that God whose protection we had implored and render us contemptible to every true friend of liberty in the world, unquote. Was Luther Martin an isolated Southerner in believing that without the abolition of slavery, political coalescence would never occur, leaving the nation impaired and divided while slavery continued to exist? Far from it. The documentary record is dotted with expressions that a cataclysm was nearly guaranteed in trying to maintain a republic of slaveholders. In 1798, when he was planning a will that would free scores of slaves after his death, Washington told an English visitor that, quote, only the rooting out of slavery can perpetuate the existence of our union by consolidating it in a common bond of principle. So here is abolishing slavery is a unifying rather than a dividing proposition. James Madison, the chief architect of the Constitution, was also tormented by the notion that slavery would tear up the fabric and the unity of the new nation. <clears throat> Ending slavery, in Madison's view, would unify, not irreparably split the nation, because the death of slavery would prevent sectionalism from reaching such a pitch that union would no longer be possible. There's a 
second objection to the political, a, a second dimension of, of this idea of political fragility. Um, and it concerns Georgia and South Carolina. They were the two states, always the most belligerent whenever the question of abolishing slavery came up. Historians who believe that slavery could not have been abolished in the revolutionary era return again and again to the quotations of Georgian and South Carolina delegates to the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention. John Rutledge, for example, from South Carolina said, if slavery was debated, whether the slaves are their property, there is an end of the Confederation. Now, this is the kind of statement that historians have to go back to again and again to say that South Carolina and Georgia would have simply walked out uh, and left the nation divided. Well, there's no doubt that there was a militant defense of slavery coming from the Lower South. But historians, I think, have not adequately considered whether these two states were truly in a position to dictate national policy on this crucial issue. This proposition requires bowing to the notion that the weak can control the powerful. Georgia and South Carolina, in fact, were the weakest of the 13 states. In 1787, they had a far greater need of a strong federal government than the rest of the states had need of them. In Georgia's backcountry, the revolution left the social fabric torn grievously by the time the war ended five years before the Constitutional Convention. General William Moultrie, riding 100 miles eastward from the backcountry of Georgia in 1782, described a countryside previously flush with livestock, in his words, and wild fowl of every kind, now destitute of all. Not the vestiges of horses, cattle, hogs, or deer can be found. The squirrels and birds of every kind were totally destroyed." Unquote. It is no surprise, given this wartime devastation, that rice and indigo production in the three years after the war stood at half the level in 1770 to 73. Likewise, South Carolina, on the eve of the Constitutional Convention, was struggling with a wrenching debt crisis. While staggered by the loss of tens of thousands of slaves through death and flight to the British during the war years, military historian Don Higginbotham tells us that Georgia was, quote, so ravaged by war that its governmental processes had collapsed and its society had disintegrated to the point that it approached John Locke's savage state of nature." Unquote. After the war, when the British closed the West Indi Indies to American ships, both South Carolina and Georgia were hamstrung and isolated all the more, and all the more, therefore, in the need of inclusion in a nationwide economic compact. And now, while nursing their strangled economy back to health, their Creek Indian enemies threatened their very ex existence. In 1786, the emergence of the mixed race Alexander McGillifrey, a Creek great beloved man, unified the fractious Creeks, led Creek war parties against Georgia frontiersmen who had poured into disputed areas of the Creek's ancient homelands and threw the state entirely on the defensive. Armed by the Creeks, uh, armed by the Spanish, the Creeks swept the back country clean in 1786 and drove returning frontiersmen out the next summer. As the Constitutional Convention got underway, South Carolinians and Georgians trembled at the prospect of a pan-Indian alliance in the back country. It is no wonder that George Washington remarked, quote, if a weak state with powerful tribes of Indians in its rear and the Spanish on its flank, speaking of Georgia, do not incline to embrace a strong general government, there must, I should think, be either wickedness or in insanity in their conduct, unquote. Well, no doubt wickedness existed aplenty in Georgia, but insanity there was not. The ratifying convention in Georgia rushed pell-mell to endorse the Constitution unanimously. It took 
one half a day for them to decide uh, almost without debate. In full confidence, as their state representatives to Congress said in 1789, in full confidence that a good, complete, and efficient national government would succor and relieve them from the Creeks and the Spanish, unquote. This desperate condition of the Lower South makes their threats to withdraw from the new nation if the new government addressed the issue of slavery ring hollow indeed. Granting the intense commitment to slavery among Georgians and Carolinians, what might have happened? if the other states had not accommodated them on the slavery issue. To be sure, many politicians talked of separate confederacies, a northern uh, splitting the nation into the north, the mid-Atlantic, and the south, but this was rhetorical posturing. It was a game of blind man's bluff. None of the stratagems for breaking up the nation received serious consideration. Among all the bluffers, South Carolina and Georgia, still reeling for the Revolutionary War and Indian enemies, were in the worst position to strike out on their own. Would they have established a Deep South nation of their own as part of Catholic Spain's American Empire or as part of a British West Indies Confederacy, embracing the nation, the country against which they had fought? None of these were remotely possible. And if South Carolina and Georgia had recklessly seceded from the Union. Would the rest of the states been deeply damaged? Hardly. We would have lost a paltry 5 to 6 percent of the country's population in 1787. By the late 1780s, most Southerners admitted privately that even the entire South could not make it on its own. Tench Cox, a leading political economist of the period, made the point in 1790 by showing how thoroughly the southern, uh, the upper south was commercially tied to the northern states. <clears throat> well, as it turned out, Georgians and South Carolinians did not have to shuffle their options if the other states took a forceful position on the slave trade and slavery. To their delight, northerners and Chesapeake leaders, Virginians, Marylanders, who had argued the necessity of banished slavery because a republic could not be built on the foundations of coerced labor, proved willing to swallow the notion that they must live with a contradiction between slavery and republicanism. The source of this, un, of this willingness was not in the aces held in the hands of Georgia and South Carolina, but in the unwillingness of the northern states to participate in solving the slavery problem. The sad truth is that northern anti-slavery sentiment, for all its strength, translated poorly into bearing responsibility for concrete steps for abolishing chattel bondage. Most northerners refused to recognize slavery as a problem that Americans in every region of the country, not just southerners, must address. Madison would say some years later, in authoring his own emancipation scheme, quote, it is the nation which is to reap the benefit of emancipation. The nation, therefore, ought to bear the burden, unquote. But it became all too evident that the Constitutional Convention, as we all know, that the revolution's leaders, while providing a new frame of national government that capped their achievement, backed away from what many knew was essential to create a more perfect union. This pregnant phrase that opened the Constitution was followed by five clauses protecting slavery, and this ensured that the delegates created a less perfect union. Northern pocketbook tenderness trumped conscience when the New England representatives traded their support for protecting the slave trade for 20 years for Southern support for eliminating all but incidental state duties on exports, a boon to shipping-oriented northern states. <clears throat> Sidestepping the slavery issue at the Constitu Constitutional Convention in the standard textbook rendition more or less ends the talk about abolishing slavery. But this is by no means true. The first Congress to sit under the ratified Constitution found itself beset immediately 
with Quaker and Pennsylvania Abolition Society petitions, filled with forthright language about, to quote one of them, the gross national iniquity of trafficking in the persons of fellow men, unquote. Though it's not mentioned in the textbooks, but the, these petitions to the first Congress produced a full-scale debate on slavery and the power of the nation's government to ameliorate it. It led, indeed, to no congressional action at that time, yet the issue of abolishing slavery still remained very much alive. It became evident again in the Constitution under consideration for the newly recognized state of Kentucky in the early 1790s. Among the elected delegates to write a Kentucky Constitution were 16 passionately anti-slavery delegates. Set against them were 26 pro-slavery delegates, most of them Virginians who'd moved into the bluegrass region. Historian Roger Kennedy reasons, quote, a little weight on the anti-slavery side might have swung things the other way. For the Western frontier, filled with evangelical Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, was ripe for the politics of conscience and hungry for leadership, unquote. Moreover, schemes for emancipating the growing number of slaves kept popping up in the early 1790s, occasioning more vigorous debate. Ferdinando Fairfax, Washington's Virginia neighbor and protege, floated one in 1790. A nameless author proposed another in Baltimore in the same year. Another came from Virginia's constitutional scholar, St. George Tucker, in 1796. Another from Virginia's, uh, uh, later in, in Virginia. All of these plans recognized the ocean of white prejudice against black people and knew that any emancipation would have to be phased rather than immediate and total, but all assumed that slavery must be abolished if the nation was to stand firm under its new constitution. More debatable, actually, than abolishing slavery was what to do with emancipated slaves, an issue contested at this very time in England where abolitionists were preparing to repatriate freedmen and freed women scattered around the English Empire to the West African colony of Sierra Leone. In sum, the problem was neither a lack of energy among advocates of abolitionism nor a lack of concrete plans for the gradual obliter obliteration of slavery. The missing element was strong leadership on a crucial issue. One of the lessons of history is that in cases where a fundamental change has been accomplished in the face of heavy odds, inspired leadership has been critically important. In such cases, those in pivotal positions of power have been willing to embrace controversy, incur the wrath of opponents, and sacrifice politeness and even friendship in order to reach a goal dictated by conscience. Strong leaders have persuaded resistant publics rather than succumbing to them, even to face political ruin with honor. One term for this is political courage. What America needs is leadership, proclaimed Jimmy Carter on July 25th at Boston's Fleet Center this year. The same was true after the revolution when political courage was most needed to solve the infant republic's greatest problems, the nation's leaders in the North and Upper South failed to lead. Let me cite cases. In the North, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams were two critical figures who had the chance to make a crucial difference. Many of their friends loathed slavery and saw it as a malignant cancer eating at the nation's moral and political innards. Others, such as Benjamin James Wilson, one of the architects of the Constitution, believed in his words, the abolition of slavery is within the reach of the federal government, unquote. And he expected that the Congress, in his words, will exterminate slavery from within our borders. Now, Franklin, indeed, was crippled uh, and stripped of his unforgettable energy and insouciance. 
by the 17, early 1790s. And to his credit, he had agreed to become the president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society in 1787, after it reorganized to launch a more muscular anti-slavery campaign. He also lent his name to the petition to the first Congress in 1790 to abolish the slave trade. And in April 1790, he published his last essay, a brilliant satiric attack on slavery, where he likened southern slave owners to Algerian pirates who sold captured white Christian sailors into bondage. But this essay, he chose to have appear anonymously. Of all the founding fathers, it must be said, Franklin exerted himself the most on behalf of abolition, yet he used only part of the vast reserve of credit he had amassed with the public at large. The case of John Adams is different. His political influence and fund of respect certainly would have helped convince the North that its contributions toward a compensated emancipation were essential to solving a truly national problem. Some Adams biographers, most recently David McCullough, argue that Adams, in McCullough's words, was utterly opposed to slavery and the slave trade and favored a gradual emancipation of all slaves, unquote. In fact, it was Abigail Adams who utterly, was utterly opposed to slavery. It was Abigail who expressed herself freely and publicly to this effect, and it was John who did his best to keep anti-slavery off the Patriot reform agenda and sidetracking side a gradual abolition bill in the Massachusetts legislature in 1777 and studiously ignoring the opportunity to follow Pennsylvania's Gradual Abolition Act of 1780 when Adams served as main author of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. After the revolution, Adams did nothing to hurry slavery to extinction. Abigail urged him to oppose slavery more forcefully, but her husband never publicly risked any of his capital, either as vice president or president. In 1795, while vice president, he admitted with start startling frankness in a letter to a friend that slavery, he said, was a subject to which I have never given any particular attention, unquote. Let's turn to the Southern leaders, and especially to the big three of Virginia, the Virginia Triumvirate, Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. They were the ones strategically positioned to take the lead on the slavery issue. All three professed a hatred of slavery and a fervent desire to see it ended in their own time. As President, Secretary of State, and floor leader in the House of Representatives, they knew of their unusual leverage as opinion shapers and political persuaders. Moreover, some of their closest colleagues, including George Mason, Patrick Henry, Arthur Lee, Robert Carter, Ferdinando Fairfax, and Edmund Pendleton, publicly supported the gradual abolition of slavery. What also might have girded their loins in becoming resolute leaders was the readiness of Virginia's two most eminent lawyer judges, George With and St. George Tucker. Both were friends in confidence of Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. With, married into one of Virginia's elite slave-owning families, had come to hate slavery by the time he received appointment as professor of law at William and Mary in 1779. His sentiments on the subject of slavery, Jefferson wrote as an English friend, are unequivocal and Jefferson went on to describe how With preached the doctrine of anti-slavery to, quote, all the young men of Virginia under preparation for public life, unquote. Stepping down from William and Mary uh, faculty in 1790, With moved on to Virginia's highest court. In 1801, he ruled in favor of the freedom for an enslaved woman and her children, along with some sweeping assertions about the inconsistency of slavery with the first article of Virginia's Declaration of Rights, the Inalienable Rights Preamble. St. George Tucker su su succeeded with as William and Mary's law professor in 1790, 
and he was equally certain that Virginia and the United States could never fulfill its destiny of leading the, nation, the world's nations toward freedom while clasping the viper of slavery to its bosom. Married into the slave and land-rich Bland and Randolph families, Tucker had seen some of his wife's slaves and many of his brother-in-law and father-in-law's slaves escape to the British during the American Revolution. After the war, he knew that many of Virginia's most distinguished families were wallowing in indebtedness as their armies of slaves worked unprofitably on land exhausted tobacco plantations. A mutiny at one of his in-laws plantations in 1787 heightened his disgust with slavery. By 1790, Tucker had William and Mary students examine, in his words, the inconsistency between our avowed principles and practices and whether it is practicable to wipe off that stigma of slavery from our nation and government, unquote. By 1794, he was writing an abolition plan, uh, sharing it with his students. Shortly, he published it. In sum, the two powerhouse legal minds of Virginia in the 1780s and 90s, operating at the state's intellectual nerve center at William and Mary and on the bench of the state's highest court were both staunchly determined to eradicate slavery. Washington, Jefferson, and Madison knew that they could count on the support of these two men if they decided to step forward on the slavery issue. Washington, as Henry Wiencheck has recently shown, had been troubled ever since seeing black soldiers fighting valiantly for the American cause about this business of slavery. Washington called slavery, quote, the foul stain of manhood and contemplated as the war drew to an end whether he might not be the key figure in securing the un unalienable rights of all men. Pushing him hard was the dashing young Marquis de Lafayette, who had become far more to Washington than a comrade in arms amidst the din of war, virtually an adopted son for the childless Washington. After the war from abroad, the French nobleman acted on earlier wartime talks with Washington about rooting slavery out of America. Lafayette proposed that the nation's conquering hero join him in an experiment to free all their slaves. Lafayette said he would purchase, at his expense, he would purchase an estate in French Guiana, and there his slaves and Washington's slaves would go set free and given the land to settle on. Quote, such, this is what Lafayette wrote Washington. Such an example as yours might render it a general practice. And Lafayette said that he even imagined that, quote, if we succeed in America, he, Lafayette, would devote himself to spreading the experiment to the West Indies. If it be a wild scheme, Lafayette concluded, I had rather be mad this way than be thought wise in the other tack, unquote. Washington did not dismiss the idea, and he knew he might be the exemplar for others to follow. Quote, I shall be happy to join you in so laudable a work, he wrote Lafayette, and would welcome seeing his surrogate son back from Europe to discuss the details. Lafayette indeed came back to Mount Vernon in 1784 where they discussed the experiment further. Then in 1785, the next year, Robert Pleasance of Virginia again appealed to Washington's, quote, fame in being the successful champion of American liberty, unquote. Now, Pleasance was from an old stock Virginia family of slave-owning Quakers, and by the time of the Revolution, he was convinced that he would free his own slaves. This became possible only after Virginia made such manumissions legally possible in 1782, a measure that led many Virginians, including some of Washington's neighbors, to free some 10,000 slaves in the 1780s and 20,000 by the end of the century. Pleasance pressed hard 
reminding Washington of his unique place in history. He begged Washington, quote, to remember the cause for which thou wert called to the command of the American army, the cause of liberty and the rights of mankind, unquote. How would history remember him, Pleasance asked, if, quote, impartial thinking men read that many who were warm advocates for that noble cause should now withhold the right of freedom that is acknowledged to be the natural and unalienable rights of all mankind, unquote. Washington did not answer Pleasant's letter so far as we know, perhaps because by now he was giving up on the idea of joining Lafayette's experiment. Lafayette now, by 1786, had indeed purchased the land in French Guiana and was settling his, setting his slaves free and settling them there. He wrote once more, um, or, or, excuse me, writing from Mount Vernon in May 8, 1786, Washington showed signs of waffling. And dismayed, Washington wrote back, quote, I would never have drawn my sword in the cause of America if I could have conceived thereby that I was founding a land of slavery, unquote. Rather than blaming his own change of heart on freeing his slaves, Washington blamed what he called the minds of the people of this country, who he told Lafayette would not tolerate such benevolence and humanity. Yet slaveholding continued to gnaw at Washington after he became the nation's first president in 1790. Henry Wiecek, in an important new book, feels that Washington drafted a public statement in which he would announce as he assumed the presidency that he was freeing some of his slaves and preparing others for eventual emancipation. Had this occurred, it would have established the precedent that the man elected to the highest office in the nation should disavow slavery before occupying that office. The ripple effect might have been enormous. Also near at hand, a short distance from Mount Vernon, occurred an event presenting Washington with another chance to turn conscience into action. His neighbor, Robert Carter, whose family name was synonymous with slave power, astonished everyone in 1791 by penning a deed of gift that would free all of his 450 slaves and thereby offer Washington and other Virginians a way forward. Carter had joined a Baptist congregation where most of the worshipers were poor and black or black, and among them sentiment ran strong against slavery. Now we might dismiss Carter as eccentric or dazed by evangelical visions of the millennium or simply deranged, but his words in the deed of gift were those that Washington and many of his fellow planters had already used themselves and found unexceptional. Here are the words from the deed of gift. I have for some time past been convinced that to retain them in slavery is contrary to the pr true principles of religion and justice, unquote. But where Carter differed from his neighbors was the logical completion of this sentence, which went on, and that therefore it is my duty to free them, unquote. Carter began releasing slaves in groups and set them up on land of their own, sometimes within sight of nominee Paul, his plantation seat. He invited them to rename themselves in a kind of symbolic rebirth, and he repulsed attempts of white neighbors to contest his deed of gift. Through this self-sacrificing act, demonstrating that emancipation was not impossible, but a matter of choice, Carter provided a model for other powerful men to follow. Many did follow, to the extent that one out of every black Virginians was free by the year of Washington's death in 1799. But Washington, again, would not make any public statement against slavery. Nobody, complained St. George Tucker bitterly, was prepared to meet the blind fury of the enemies of freedom in Virginia. A leader of men under arms, Washington could not bring himself to become a leader of armless men, appealing 
to the nation's conscience. Next to Washington, the Virginian with the greatest moral capital and political influence to trade on also spurned the opportunity to help end the system of coerced labor <clears throat> that he knew compromised the American Republic erected for all nations to emulate. By the early 1790s, Jefferson had become an international symbol. Identified, as Dumas Malone, his biographer, writes, identified in the public mind, both at home and abroad, with the freedom of individual human beings from political tyranny and oppression of any sort, unquote. No founding father, some have said, was blunter about the loathsomeness of slavery. Jefferson called slavery an abominable crime. He called it a hideous blot on civilized society. He called it a moral and political depravity. And to quote the historian well known in this precinct, Jefferson possessed the kind of mind that could have made the difference. Bernard Balin words, a restless, tenacious mind, as fertile in formulating abstract ideas as in solving the most ordinary mundane problems. And through it all there glows a humane and generous purpose to ameliorate the condition of life, to broaden the reach of liberty, and to assist in the pursuit of happiness. But Jefferson brought none of these qualities to bear on the slavery issue. Only against slavery, Michael Zuckerman writes, did he appear paralyzed in policy and immobilized even in imagination, unquote. Jefferson squandered the respect he enjoyed as a national leader and an internationally famous son of the Enlightenment. In his attachments to never-ending re renovations at Monticello, Jefferson buried the thought of giving freedom to the hundreds of slaves surrounding him there. Nine years before he died, he refused to serve as the executor of General Thaddeus Kosciusko's estate. Kosciusko was the Pole who came over as a mil military engineer and fought longer with the Revolutionary Army than any European who came. Uh, he left his entire American estate, all of his military pay of seven years of war in the hands of Jefferson. And in the deed, in the will, he asked Jefferson to use the money, which amounted to $17,000, to free the slaves at Monticello, or as many uh, as, uh, as could be purchased with that amount of money. Jefferson decided to file with the court that he could not ex uh, serve as the executor of the estate. Aside from the lives of his own slaves, the larger matter, of course, was statesmanship. His storied biographer Dumas Malone calls Jefferson one of the most effective party leaders in our history. This had certainly been the case when Jefferson drafted the Ordinance of 1784, which included the pregnant phrase that, quote, after the year 1800, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the states created out of the Western lands. This bold stroke obtained the approval of six of the 13 states in the Continental Congress in 1784 and lost the crucial seventh state, New Jersey, due to the sickness of an absent member. And after this, Jefferson's outspokenness on slavery evaporated. In his book, Jefferson's Lost Cause, Roger Kennedy opines that Jefferson's, quote, tragedy lay in his unwillingness to make full use of his talent for persuasion to tip the balance when on a series of occasions choices were made to permit and sometimes to encourage the spread of slavery, unquote. My colleague at UCLA, Jeffersonian scholar Joyce Appleby, concurs that Jefferson, quote, backed away from attacking the institution at his, as his power to do something about it increased, unquote. Jefferson remained utterly silent, both publicly and privately. First, as Kentucky debated its constitution, and second, after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Don Fehrenbacher writes, one might have expected the author of the Ordinance of 1784 to view the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory as a tabula rasa, 
and make some effort to inhibit the spread of the slave institution into a vast domain still largely free of white settlement, unquote. But Jefferson's president, Fehrenbacher, tells us never lifted his hand against slavery, except in the matter of terminating the importation of slaves. Jefferson's administration was functionally pro-slavery, and it produced a rigorous slave code to be used by Congress in organizing the new Louisiana Territory. Henry Adams, the grandson of John and Abigail Adams, put his finger perhaps on Jefferson's failure of leadership. Henry Adams wrote, Jefferson's yearning for sympathy was almost feminine. He wanted to be liked, or to be more precise, he hated to be disliked, according to Dumas Malone. Avoiding conflict with white friends and compatriots crippled Jefferson in helping to avoid the Holocaust that he knew to his final days was coming closer and closer. And finally, as for Madison, a towering intellect did not translate into political leadership either in the crucial 1780s and 1790s or later as the nation's fourth president on the issue of slavery. As principal drafter of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, Madison indisputably had enormous moral and political credit to draw on. Nor is there doubt that he had what Drew McCoy calls anti-slavery credentials that can be fairly described as impeccable. In Philadelphia at the end of the revolution, Madison had agreed that his runaway slave, Billy, was as, Ad as Madison wrote his father, merely coveting that liberty for which we have paid the price of so much blood and have proclaimed so often to be the right of every human being, unquote. Like Washington, Madison had toyed in the 1780s with extricating himself from slave-based Virginia by buying land in upstate New York where he might become a gentleman farmer using free labor. He abandoned the plan but throughout his public career, McCoy tells us, he never wavered for a moment in utterly condemning the institution. His categorical opposition to slavery generated an unyielding commitment to abolishing it in the United States. For him, the question was never if, or rather when and how, unquote. Yet Madison, like Jefferson and Washington, shrank from becoming an active part of the how. Most tellingly, in the 1790s, Madison penned an essay, The Influence of Domestic Slavery on Government. And here, he warned that the Southern slave regimes could not help but produce concentrations of political power, aristocracies was the proper name for them, that ran squarely athwart the democratic foundations on which the republic was built. But Madison never published the essay. He kept it to himself. He withheld it from the other essays he published in the early 1790s to mobilize opposition to the Federalist policies engineered by Alexander Hamilton. Later in his career, he grew stronger in his belief that the American represent, Revolution represented the decisive turning point in human history, one that would teach other nations that the future lay with instituting self-governing republics. And stitched to this belief was his certainty that republics could not survive the stain of slavery, and that America's international influence would always be compromised by its continuation. Yet for all this private anguish, he could not move from word to deed any more than Washington or Jefferson. Why, asked Drew McCoy, didn't this sage and honest man statesmen understand and publicly acknowledge the need for swift and effective action against slavery, unquote. If Washington had carried through his pledge in 1783 to join Lafayette in the grand experiment, Lafayette's words, of freeing their slaves, if Jefferson, Madison, Washington, and, and a few others who professed to despise slavery had stepped forward to follow the example of Robert Carter in emancipating their slaves, or to endorse or improve on one of the gradual emancipation plans put forward 
And if northern leaders such as John Adams and Benjamin Franklin had drawn on their fund of respect to support a plan for gradual emancipation and convince northerners of their stake in contributing to its implementation for the sake of an enduring union, the course of history would have changed in the 1790s. 60 years later, 60 years after Jefferson became president in 1801, more than 600,000 Americans lost their lives and as many went home with shattered bodies from a war where emancipation became one of the Union's main goals. Roughly one at the end of the Civil War lay dead and another cripple, crippled equal to the number of males and females to, left to perpetual lives of unpaid labor in the new United States as Washington took office as our first president. Thank you. Senator McGillivray is a, is a perfect example. He became a, a leader and a unifier of the Creek Nation. Um, we, we can speak of a red family father here. And, and he, he was well known in Washington because he was a powerful man. And he was very skillful at trying to trade Spain and the United States off against each other in order to gain advantages for the Creeks. Um, and he was, uh, when he was told that uh, Washington, uh, that our federal government had um, dispatched uh, people to assassinate him, he said that he would regard himself as George Washington, uh, and that if he was to be assassinated, it would be in defense of the same principles for which the Americans fought the revolution. 
particular question um, is, is one way to think about the answer to that to look at the gradual abolition in northern states. And what, how much leverage would we get on what on the fact that northern states, including New York, which had substantial slave population, not like Virginia, South Carolina, but big enough that there was some real cost to nevertheless abolish slavery slowly, gradually, over generations, and so on. So how much leverage do we get on why the southern leaders didn't pursue the abolition by looking at why the northern states, in fact, did? Or more generally, why did they not? Well, I, um, if Harvard uh, Press publishes uh, the lectures, as I suppose they will, uh, you will find more in there about it. I mean, it, it, it boils down to the people had to deal with the economic question, compensating slave owners. No one suggested that the, uh, there should be uncompensated emancipation of slaves. But um, that was the economic question, how to pay for it, and I addressed that part of it. The part I didn't address was the social problem that had to be solved. It involved thinking of emancipated slaves as part of a biracial republic. And on that ground, uh, the Northerners um, were uh, as blameable as the Southerners. Um, but once again, I return to the question of leadership. We study history for examples of how uh, the improbable became um, a reality and how odds sometimes staggering, uh, were overcome. Uh, we admire people in history who fight against these odds. Um, we call them great political leaders because they bring a resistant public into a new frame of thinking. Um, so there were, of course, big obstacles pulling this off. So I was trying to argue that... Do you think none of these could imagine themselves living in a biracial republic and that was the end point, that was the real blockage? Well, some uh, uh, thought so. Um, and it was happening in the northern cities, um, at least for a generation or so, before things, the tide of, of white racism uh, got flowed stronger and stronger. Um, but again, people had been living together uh, from the very beginning, in very close contact, intimate contact for a very, very long time. The unthinkable, too, is that we're being related. I mean, Jefferson has children, <laughs> but Sally Hemings, and that's not unusual. Yeah. And this, this denial of this connection. I mean, I see the model of bankruptcy as that ambiguity and, and, and the failure to accommodate free nations here. Even the Somerset case in England, where you, you suggest there was the same problem of what to do with the free people. Lord Somerset's brother is married to a uh, Jamaican and have children who are children of fortune. They are people, colored people with privilege. And you know, we had Haiti happen, we had the Latin American Revolution happen, and we had the Spanish and the, the French accommodating Maroons, these three agencies, who are what? Apostles of freedom. And there's, there's this danger, all right? I mean, even people in Georgia who had colored children and men wanted to manumit them and leave them, leave them fortunes are restricted from doing so by the laws of Georgia. They would have to go to Rhode Island and Connecticut. And this nation is plagued. It's not just our founding fathers. It's an issue of us today. Reparations, for example. No please, please give us your name so we can all get to know each other better. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I have a question. I need to sound so cynical, but I guess what's bothering me This is Professor Higginbotham. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess what's bothering me is that I, I love the 
values these people who do fight against. And it's odd. I, I like that. But I'm, I'm just troubled by the fact that these men didn't even end the slave trade. Remember in the Declaration of Independence when Jefferson, or, or one of them inserts States had abolished the slave trade in the revolutionary year, years, uh, including Virginia and Maryland. They they did not import any more slaves. Well, There's right, only the lower argument. south states that didn't abolish it. So why yes? Yeah, so yeah, why didn't the, the Constitutional Convention? They just ended right there. Yeah, exactly. And, and why such power of, of South Carolina and Georgia? Right. And one of the arguments again, I'll say, it, is that some people did make the argument that yeah, Virginia could abolish it then because it gave Virginia a very unique position with slave pricing. I, I don't know, I mean, I just, I'm not quite so sanguine to these guys. I'm Sean Bond, One of the things you mentioned in the election that was quite compelling was the notion of Washington, of his political leaders, their understanding of the collective will, that in some sense there's this opposition force that they perceive out there in the public, in the mass, very real, it has very real manifestation, but at the same time creates, in a sense, this decision, the, the context in which they make this decision about how they approach slavery and how they approach these opportunities to go against slavery, to abolish slavery. And I was wondering if you could speak possibly a little bit about how the notion of the collective, or how they kind of understood that notion of the collective conscious, what the American public wanted in this time period. Well, you know, I would say that they were masters of uh, um, reaching the public, uh, of resisting public, because that's what they had to do to get the Revolutionary War going. Uh, I mean, after all, that started with, with, with sm a small number of people, and the Revolutionary fervor had to be spread very widely in order to take on Great Britain. So they're, they're not so innocent of that whole business of mass mobilization, opinion shapers. They, uh, more than uh, most others, uh, were over the past uh, two set of the whole history of colonial settlement in the America. This was the generation that had become most inventive, innovative, and, and accomplished in, in moving the masses, if you want to put it that way. I don't think it's manipulating, but it, it, it's trying to exercise leadership. Um, Franklin was a, a, a genius at it. Um, he, he could talk the Philadelphians into almost anything <laughs> through you know, wit, through the power of his language, um, and, and his adroitness as a, you know, a, a politician. So seems to me that they have a whole fund of experience in this realm of, of, of shaping a, a collective will. They just come out of a war where they have done it. Um, Please tell us. insurrections and skirmishes and incidents of slave insurrections here had on the conversation 
seem to, uh, to take the case of Virginia, um, that, that these uh, revolts and uh, Gabriel's revolt of 1800 is a good example. You know, it, it told them that there was all the more reason to deal with this question of slavery. It wasn't going to go away. Um, and after Gabriel's thwarted rebellion, there was more talk about a gradual abolition of slavery. Between then and Nat Turner's rebellion, 1831, uh, things had changed a lot. Part of it because of the importance of cotton, and the economic um, the ratcheting up, tremendous, tremendously uh, interest in, in slavery. But these revolts, uh, St. George Tucker, when he saw this small mutiny on just one plantation, that convinced him, I gotta work harder to convince these Virginians. 20 more of us. This is what Jefferson was the fire bell in the night. Um, but there was never the kind of patient mass rebellion. smaller rebellions fueled further debates on getting rid of what people were still agreeing was an evil institution. It's not really till later that Southerners begin to defend slavery uh, as a positive institution. That doesn't come until the 1820s. Really, you know, around the time of the Missouri Compromise, In the back. Um, thanks. Just actually responding to your name? Mark Hanna. Thank you. Responding to that, that comment, I, thought that I was thinking the same thing, but it seems like you're, there's two different issues at stake. One is sort of an ideological, intellectual discussion of the problem of slavery as it relates to you know, the, the discussion of the values of the revolution. On the other hand, it's a sort of emotional anxiety and fears that are coupled together. And in response to the Haitian Revolution, I see sort of two things going. One is this intellectual response, which is, of course, I just read a file of the Princeton, though, which tries to measure the impact of the Haitian Revolution just in the Philadelphia area. Uh, and what's so astounding is the papers were filled with it. I mean, all, all this dissertation writer had to do was go to the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> and the note cards began to pile up, so he was drowning in them. Then he had to figure it out. How did people uh, divide on the issue? Were they for it? Were they against it? Um, in a couple of sentences, was that they, uh, there was a lot of support for it, and it was seen as a way of pushing American abolition, abolitionism forward uh, in the first several years from 1791 to roughly 1794. When the reign of terror kicks in in France, and the, and the uh, Black Rebellion in Haiti gets even bloodier, when uh, Catherine says it's, it's virtually burned to the ground by slaves, self-liberated people, um, opinion begins to change. And of course, in the South, then it just scares the 
throughout the 1790s. Arson, there's a remarkable occurrence of, uh, of arson in the American towns and cities. Charleston nearly burns to the crack. Well, I think it's, the figures are about 40% of all the houses in Charleston burned in 1793. A woman specifically talking about Haiti and the Black Rebellion. Um, so yeah, but it, it's, um, all you graduate students out there, get to work. There's more to be here. Uh, let's end the silence over this incredible world-shaking event and the American reaction to it. Yes. <laughs> 
one of the things I will say tomorrow, which would be a partial answer to this, is that um, it gets connected to this question of who makes America the redeemer nation. We get the phrase, and it's substitute phrases used over and over again. We use it today in political speech, the redeemer nation. But by the 1820s, it was African Americans uh, who were arguing that if the nation was to be redeemed, it was going to have to be through their efforts because it looked like the abolitionist cause had, had caved. Um, so I would say that much about the, the connection of this to the larger moral issue how we characterize the broader swath of American history. But, but I will return to this tomorrow. Yes, sir. Just to follow Jennifer's question, um, slavery was abolished in other parts of the country for various reasons. Can you imagine changes in the economy, for instance, in the rest of the country or policy in Washington that might have had a consequence of making it easier to abolish slavery? Still, I don't think that alone uh, can explain everything. After all, England hasn't uh, emancipated all the slaves in Jamaica and Barbados and all the West Indies uh, by 1834. Um, so America is among the last of the nations to abolish slavery. Lasted uh, in the Americas longer only in Brazil. So these economic changes that are taking place throughout the Western world uh, are not uh, particular to the United States or any, any other place, but um, the cotton gin did make things more difficult. Yes, sir. Early 1860s. But I 
what I was wondering is, to what extent were they proud of their sense of, be, of being an American as something special? Or to, to what extent did the general population, and to what extent did the founding fathers see themselves as having done something unique, something you know extraordinary? To what extent did they see themselves as having a special destiny? Did, was that sort of fully formed early? Harder 